Do not adjust your television. What you are about to experience is stranger than fiction. Hey there, strangers, and welcome to Stranger Than Fiction. I'm Devin. I'm your co-host. Hi, everyone. My name is Heidi. And we are on episode 17. Woo! So we're going to be covering a apropos topic for right now. Tomorrow, as, as we're recording this, is Friday the 13th. Dun, 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 dun. An interesting fact. So I think we talked about this on our 13th episode. And we're like, oh, we, we, should. we should do that. Yeah. We, we did are, it. We're, we're here. <laughs> we're getting there. But did you know 17 is actually an unlucky number itself? Why? Because it's an odd number? In Italy. So if you, you think about like Roman numerals okay. of 17, and I'm a visual person. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll try and like show a visual in a like showcase of it. But X V. I, I is 17 in Roman numerals. Okay. If you rearrange that, it becomes V-I-X-I, which in Latin translates to I have lived, implying that you're no longer alive, that you're dead. So because of that, 17 is an unlucky number in Italy. Interesting. Whenever someone mentions uh, Roman numerals, I just think, someone call I-X-I-I! <laughs> So if, if you enjoyed that fun fact, just wait. We've got more interesting, unlucky number shenanigans ahead. But I, I don't know. I'm really excited about this episode because we watched a horror classic Friday the 13th. The original, not the 2009 remake. We went back to the 1980. The one we had was, quote, the uncut version. Oh, I didn't know that. I don't know what the difference is. What did they cut? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I will admit. because Maybe less I, gore? I don't know. I feel like the original was probably just as gory. So I don't know if then, like, when it went to home video, it got cut. But hmm. we watched the uncut version, if that makes any different, or that's just a marketing gimmick. And this was your first time. My first time, yes. So we will get into your, your thoughts about it, but uh, it was definitely an interesting experience because for those of you who have not, like Heidi, seen this, I will say the ending has a twist, would you say? Yeah. Especially if you kind I of... I didn't call that, yeah. so... So a little bit of a spoiler ahead for those who may not have ever seen the original Friday the 13th. There is an, I would say, unexpected ending of sorts. Mm -hmm. If you're you're kind of familiar with the Friday the 13th series franchise. Yeah. So without further ado, let's get to... Heidi's Heidi, 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 Dissection. Okay, well, it starts off with... <laughs> Which I was like, what the hell is you this? You never heard that? <laughs> I'd heard it from a comedian, oh. and now it makes so much sense. Like 15 years ago, yeah. I heard it. I was going to say, a it's comedian. a huge thing in pop culture. Well, the now very I get famous. It. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, so. I wrote that they're at a church camp. It's not a church. I don't know why I went for it. They, they, well, they said were hallelujah. Singing, yeah, they were singing some campfire hallelujah. So it starts off at a church camp in the 50s. It's just a camp. No, it's a church camp. And they're singing and a couple there wants to go to pound town. So they're they're getting all cozy. They put a blanket down. You know things are happening on, on the gross like hardwood cabin in, like, floor. Yeah. They're like we, we don't want to be nasty. Let's put a blanket down. Yeah. Also, ow, my back. <laughs> so anyway, so they're getting frisky, and then they hear someone. So they stop and they start like buttoning their clothes back up. And the boys Which, like. I just I will get more into some of the details. This came out after Halloween, so this re was released in 1980. 1978 Halloween came out this rips off a crap ton and one of the things is if you're familiar with Halloween you know it starts with a, a brilliant POV from Michael Myers perspective as he's kind of going through the house 
And this mimics that. Like it, you have a, a POV of of this of someone coming and catching this couple. And I was like, wow, they're they're really going straight after Halloween of just doing almost the exact same thing with a, a similar stinger and a POV shot. And I was like, uh, okay, well, we'll see. So the boy um, is looking at the camera because it's a POV shot. And he's yeah. like, we weren't doing anything, I swear. We weren't doing anything. We were just messing around. <laughs> and then uh, get stabbed. <laughs> Boom. Just First right kill. into it. It's right like, into it. It's... And then the girl screams and she is slow-mo stabbed. <laughs> it's like, ah! The and then it's a fr- it was not only a slow mo, but then it goes into a freeze frame. The slow mo in this was rough. Yeah, it was. I'm not a fan of slow mo. No, I'm not either. I, I this made it feel very dated, but that's okay. Um. So anyway, then the title Friday the Thirteenth show got the classic. It comes in, breaks the glass. Yes, and then um, we go to a girl named Annie who's just walking along. Where are your parents? She's a camp counselor. She doesn't need no parents. I mean, yeah, I guess she's 18, but like still, like how, she's where got did like she a, come from? She's got like a giant, like backpacking backpack. Yeah. And she, presumably she probably was hitchhiking a little bit because yeah. you're like, how, because she's just walking around this town with this huge 50 pound Like, pack. how do I get to this camp? And I was like, where did you even come from? How far have you been walking? Who knows? Um, So she goes up to a dog and she's like, where do I go to find Crystal? <laughs> Well, first of all, she's like, hey, girl. I mean, boy. Hi, girl. Excuse me. Hi, boy. Hey, you speak English? How far is it to Camp Crystal Lake? Okay. That was odd. <laughs> anyway, so she is going to be the cook at this camp. So then she goes and says, you know, hey, where can I find Camp Crystal Lake? She goes into a diner in this sleepy town. Yes. And they're like, oh, that place is cursed. Uh, but sure, I'll give you a ride. Then we cut. No, no, no! You did. You missed the best character. My favorite oh, character yes. in this whole whole <laughs> film is Ralph. You'll never come back again. Who, I? It's been it's been many years since I've seen this. I don't remember this character, but all I can think of when I was seeing this is: Do you remember in Cabin in the Woods? Where they like make fun of the, I think they call him like the harbinger. Like there's a specific character that like warns the people oh, yeah, about yeah, to go yeah. into like the cabin the of the woods. Like it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it's like the, a guy, the guy at the gas, gas station. station. Yeah. And to me, I was like, that's funny. Not really thinking like that ever happened in a movie. That's mm-hmm. just kind of our collective conscious idea. Like maybe it happens in like Scooby Doo. Mm-hmm. I was like, no, straight up, they clearly were like, no, Ralph is this nut job who's like, you can't go to Camp Blood. Go to Camp Blood, ain't ya? You're gonna get murdered. And they're all just like, mm, crazy, Ralph. Oh, Ralph. I'll drive you there in my truck. Anyway, so then we cut to Kevin Bacon, ladies and gentlemen. Shirtless Kevin Bacon. That was a surprise. He's not shirtless in this. He's like half shirt on. I didn't think it's like, he, like off it, his shoulder. Oh, uh, it, it looked like he was naked. Yeah, so Kevin Bacon is in a truck with a boy and a girl. And they're listening to banjo music. <laughs> yeah. It was like... Dung, 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 was, dung, dung, dung. <laughs> I mean, talking about the music, there was a lot of interesting choices, but I really hated the banjo. You know, every time I go to camp, I listen to banjo music. They just so get you in the mood. Represent. So then <laughs> um, there's a random... So they pull up to the camp and there's a random shirtless guy with a mustache cutting wood and he puts the kids right to work he's wearing jean shorts very 80s no shirt no creeper shirt. stash and he's glasses. like oh hey kids help me move this wood and the, I, I they wanted to like pull a, yeah. a stump out yeah and so he puts them right to work and then this girl named alice gets hit on by this guy so we find out his name is steve and he is the director of the camp yeah. he's been investing money and they said twenty five thousand dollars like that's a lot of money it um, was in 1980. Yeah. I, I don't know what, <laughs> still especially with, with inflation now, but yeah. And, but Alice is, and I'm not going to knock too much on people's looks, but she's she got has a shag this, haircut and it's she, awful. It's like a, it's very seventies. Yeah. It's like early a 80s. weird bowl cut. It's like awful. it's, it's rough on her. Alice and you're is like, not Ugh. cute. And like creeper Steve with his stash, yeah, just like, like, let me just like her up. rub your hair. I your think he bucket like head. rubs her shoulder too. It's real like, creepy. It's real he's creepy. Like, you don't like it here. You can leave in a week. I'm like, dude, red flag, leave right now. Yeah, not even kill her like, aside. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. So creeper mustache Steve. Um, so then he um, drives a Jeep, which I, I noted that I like. <laughs> he has a Jeep with a Even though down. he was a creep, he yeah. had his Jeep. He has a Jeep. So Jeep creep. He gets points there. So then we switch to Annie. Annie's the cook who was, she pseudo hitchhiked. Yeah. So I mean, essentially, because she, gets... she doesn't know this trucker. And like, even in the truck, he's like, oh, you don't want to go to that camp. I know yeah. Ralph was but crazy. But I'm driving but like, you halfway there. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> so, I know I said you shouldn't go, but I'm pretty much taking you halfway to this death camp. So he drops her off in front of a cemetery, which I thought was a little foreshadowing. Yeah. I, I don't know if that was, I don't know cool. if that was intentional, but. Uh, maybe. And then she hitchhike or she walks a little bit more and then she sees a Jeep coming and it looks just like Steve's Jeep. So presumably yeah. it's Steve. Because you see Steve leave in this green Jeep. I thought it was and, blue. Uh, I thought it was green. I thought it was blue. Anyway, this <laughs> Jeep yeah. is the same color mm-hmm. and it comes up, but you don't see the driver. Mm-hmm. And she's like, she's doing the hitchhike thumb. Yeah. She's like, can I get a and, ride? And I'm going stops. to Camp Crystal Lake. Yeah, and so she gets in the car, and she gets picked up by a stranger. And at this point, we were we thought Annie was going to be the final girl. Yeah, for sure. We're like, oh, we're getting our final girl. She's and a chatterbox. Yeah, she's like, I'm just excited to cook. And like the the hitchhiker person's not saying a word. Like you think yeah. she would get a freaking social clue? No. no. Um. Anyway, so then um, you think it's Steve who picked her up, but um, they missed the turn to Camp Crystal Lake, and. Annie notices and she's like, "Well, shoot, I've uh, she's like gotten we, we myself miss, in miss deep. the turn. What this yeah, we hitchhiking should, person? We should, we should pull over." And they don't, and they start like to speed and drive crazy. So Annie's like, "I'm gonna risk it," and she jumps out of the jeep head first. Head first, yeah, literally, she like dives into the cement. Yeah, who thought that was a good choice? But then she's hobbling away like she hurt her leg. I'm like, girl, if you, you did anything, you... your head in, yeah. and you're dead. <laughs> your your neck's broken. Your leg's fine. <laughs> You're yeah. just paralyzed. So then um, she hurts her leg. She even says, ow. <laughs> that was my I favorite think she part. Like, yeah, ow. she's like, ow, ow. And I'm like, oh, wow, the acting school here really yes. did you good. And so um, the Jeep stops, noticing that Annie has jumped out. And the driver pulls over and starts chasing her in the woods. All the while, you still don't see. Yeah, you can't see who this person is. Yeah. So for all intents and purposes, it could be Steve. Yeah. And so they get her and slit her throat. And it was the first time they show an effect, although I could tell when they had yeah, like some type of makeup yeah. on because they were but, like, the skin pl- complexion was more but, pale. But I'm saying for back then it was good. Yeah, for we're seeing it on like an HD If they had done TV, it on like, like stage, I would have been like, oh, that's amazing. Well, and I'm sure back in 1980, like that was a very good effect. So I don't give any negative points for the makeup. Tom Savini doing a great job. In the 80s. So she gets her throat slit, and that's the end of Annie. So no yeah, we were like, the final girl. Well, that was the first girl, actually. So we were totally off on that one. So then we switch over to Kevin Bacon in a Speedo. <laughs> yeah, um, I wasn't, I wasn't he, ready for Kevin that. Kevin Bacon um, was not fully developed yet in this movie. Oh, he leave, looks like a 12-year-old, even though he's supposed to be 18. Leave Kevin uh, He's alone. a grower, not a shower. <laughs> I told you specifically we weren't going to bring that up. Definitely grown up. Six sure. degrees of Kevin Bacon, let's put it that way. Um, so the group is swimming in the lake, and this one girl, let's call her Jennifer Garner's mom, because I never caught her name. I yeah, we so just she looks like Jennifer this. Garner. And I thought so she, I determined that she's Jennifer Garner's mom. I, I thought she looked a little bit like Anna Paquin, but when you said Jennifer Garner, we were like, Yeah, that yeah, looks it's, like it'd it's, be her mom. Yeah. So she thinks she sees something in the woods, and then she's like, nah, I didn't see anything. I'm it's good. It's fine. It's fine. So they keep swimming, and then they get out, and um, Kevin Bacon's friend- The goofball? We, Teddy? Yeah. I think his name was Teddy. Uh, I I wrote it down later on. We'll find. I think we'll it, it I think it was Teddy the goofball. Yeah. So, or it's like, re- I don't know. So he's super fun, 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 fun character, hitting on girls and whatnot before they go swimming, and um, he starts to drown in the lake, and so everyone jumps in. Kevin Bacon's girlfriend does a beautiful dive, whereas Kevin Bacon I mean, just like belly, belly flops, flops in. <laughs> We're like, oh, nice dive, and followed by Kevin, who gets a zero. <laughs> and so he's pretending to drown, we find out. and He's pulling um, a sandlot. He gets, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Oh. Um, he gets uh, mouth to mouth from uh, Jennifer Garner's mom, and uh, he starts kissing her. So 
What a what classy a move. He sexual started it. Predator. That was before Sandlot, so mm, he started that. It's true. Um, so now fast forward to they're in the cabin and there's a snake in the cabin. Yeah, I know. and I didn't watch the scene because um, they kill the snake, and I'm a huge animal person. Not I'm not afraid of snakes. But why I didn't watch is because they actually killed the snake in real life. Yeah. I put not okay in all caps. I know. Um, but so the- yeah, so those like reactions and everything were genuine because like they literally killed the snake. And I don't know if it was the actors who killed the snake, probably a trained professional, but still they were present. I, it, it may have been Tom Savini, the the makeup artist. I, I don't know for a fact, but the the story idea was to... It kind of in contrast to like the babysitters and Halloween to show these kids are capable to take some action and defend themselves or attack. They've got a machete, which I had asked like, OK, I like I know the point yeah, of the why machete. Why do you have a machete at a camp yes. for kids? <laughs> like, I mean, could you maybe use it? Sure. But uh, they have a lot of rifles, which there's probably a rifle range yeah. and a machete. And I'm just like, this is this is asking for some trouble. Yeah. And they got it. Um, but by the way, there are no kids at the camp presently. It's just yeah. the camp counselors and Creeper Steve getting the camp ready for opening in two weeks. Sorry, yeah. forgot to mention that. <laughs> it is it is June 13th on a Friday, hence the title. It's a full moon, and it's two weeks until camp opening. I thought we had two weeks. Yes. So then they kill the snake, and I wasn't okay. And then um, a police officer shows up to the camp saying that he's looking for crazy Ralph. Well, first she's like, you got any grass? I know you're smoking. Yeah, and they're like, not smoking, man, just being weirdos. And then Kevin Bacon's like checking out this cop's motorcycle bike and like touching it and like going to grab his radio. And I'm like, what? No, you can't do that. Because he's stoned. Anyway, so (laughs) they they don't see Ralph anywhere. So the cop's like, okay, well, you see Ralph, let me know. (laughs) And so then fast forward, they're in the kitchen and because Annie's not there to cook, so they're trying oh, to yeah. like, put together a meal. And they open the pantry, and Ralph is in the pantry, and he comes out Crazy saying Ralph. he's a messenger from God yeah. and is warning them to leave. <laughs> I'm a messenger of God. You're doomed if you stay here. And the I best... love that. I'm a messenger from God. <laughs> the best part about Ralph is he just drives around town on, on his a... <laughs> bike, and he just looks so goofy, and he is the greatest character. I don't know. I've I've not seen most of Friday the 13th, the franchise. I want, want him Ralph to star to I just reoccurring. I want him as much as possible. I'll take a Ralph spinoff. I loved him. God damn it, Ralph. Get out of here. Go on, get so they go to turn on a light in the kitchen. Oh, by the way, they're not spooked by Ralph or anything. They just no. let him go. They're just like, oh, crazy old Ralph. They're like, yeah, you get on out of here. Take your bike home. <laughs> yeah. And then he goes on his way. Not that they're whatever. It's yeah. fine. So they go to turn on a light and um, it's still daytime, but the light's not working. So they're like, oh, there must be a generator out here somewhere. And so Kevin Bacon finds the generator and he turns it on. And then they show an otter in the lake I wrote. And I was very excited because there was an otter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But they don't chop with a machete. No, thank God. So then Kevin Bacon and his girl are, you know, dancing. We never got her name. Like, they didn't really introduce half these characters. Oh, it's Marcy. I I will not remember that. I looked at a further note. I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to remember that. So Kevin and Marcy start making out. But we don't even know Kevin Bacon's name. We're just calling him Kevin Bacon. Yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) there you go. We don't know his name. And the goofy friend of Kevin Bacon sees them making out. And he, like, gets a little jealous and then, like, starts, like, entertaining himself by, like, walking on a lock. I don't know. He's a weirdo. So he looks up to a cabin and he sees um, he sees someone. So he follows them into the cabin. He's like, hey, he's like, what was that? Who are you? And so he follows the mysterious person into a cabin. And then a storm starts. And this was my favorite effect in the oh, whole thing. Yes. It's supposed to be lightning. And they literally just, like, shine a flashlight they, yeah. on Kevin Bacon's face. And he's like, oh, it's lightning. Like, <laughs> it's, it's. I mean, because there's the, like, a flashlight especially those old ones had like mm-hmm. a very yellow light yes. and it's it's literally like someone just like flicked it on and off and mm-hmm. they're like oh and they have like the old school like fully effect lightning sound mm-hmm. and it's just like oh it's starting to storm and i was like really guys I, yeah. I, come on this is this is rough it was pretty good so the goofy friend never comes out of the cabin right yeah and they never saw him go in so 
Kevin Bacon and Marcy go into the cabin and they start going to Pound Town, mm-hmm. having a good as time. As you do. As you do. There's a close up on Kevin Bacon's Which butt. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and it she is, squeezes it. I, it is weird looking intercourse. Yeah, it, it is, looks very it's, vanilla it's, and boring. It's like she two didn't, planked she, people. She was just like she, she looked like she was ready to fall asleep. He he just looks like he's just kind of he's like just kind of moving. moving his body and doesn't know what he's doing. And she's like, oh, thanks, Kevin. So while they're banging, they don't know that on the top bunk yeah. is their dead friend. Yeah, they pan up and like. Teddy's dead. Teddy's deady. Yeah. Yeah. So meanwhile, while they're banging, um, their other friends, the other three camp counselors, are playing Strip Monopoly. Because they're like, I'm bored and it's raining. Let's play Strip Monopoly. I hate Monopoly. Not the way I play it, you know. Maybe okay. the, like... It was Jennifer Garner's mom's idea. I, I think Monopoly may be the least sexy board yeah. game in the history of board games. I don't care if you play strip rules. Monopoly just intrinsically is unsexy <laughs> by every sense of the word. Like, you could play Trouble, maybe Sorry, but not Monopoly. Strip Monopoly is not going to get anybody turned on, and it doesn't what, what work. What about Strip Life? <laughs> you just got four kids take off a shirt Ooh. so they start playing strip monopoly it's um one guy and two girls playing and um we pan back to kevin bacon marcy is like okay we're done i'm gonna go to the bathroom and clean off or whatever and it's a and camp so it's yeah, so not the bathroom just, it's yeah. like a separate cabin yeah so you you have to exit this this uh, the bunk cabin exactly to go to the restroom cabin Latrine, where they have whatever yeah toilets and showers. showers so she goes over there and kevin bacon is just like living it he's enjoying the post-sex life he even has a cigarette like he literally oh, they, they, they do that. the classic like oh, the the afterglow yes and uh then he gets stabbed through the bed so like upwards an yeah. arrow through his like trachea. chest or trachea oh man yeah it's rough yeah so and you were like stabbed. how did but like how did the killer, the killer do under that? the bed yeah but like, you've you've got to just like hope You've got it's enough a thin force it's a camp to go mattress. through. It's thin. <laughs> like, hope you've lined it up so it's like his his squishy trachea, not like into his spine. Like that one thrust in the right yeah. place is going to get him good. Yeah. So Kevin Bacon is no more. He's cooked. So Marcy, who just got banged, is uh, in the bathrooms and the sink isn't working. So she magically fixes it because we all have plumber skills. And which um, I, I understand, like setting up the generator and like the power like could like go out and this backup generator and blah, blah, blah. I didn't really understand the sink not working other than like, I guess the camps in disrepair. Like, yeah, that was just kind of an unnecessary point. Like, it's so, just like she's isolated. And I will say, like, props to this movie. I think a lot of horror movies I struggle because I don't believe the environment that you have this group of individuals that are isolated that are in this horrible situation and none of them have the sense to get out. Mm -hmm. But this does a very good job of uh, one by one. You're not, the others are not aware of the murders. Mm -hmm. They are mostly isolated. I I wish they cut out the cop coming because the cop shows like, well, the police, it's not so in the woods that the cops can't come by, Mm -hmm. but the other characters don't know of most of the killings of Kevin Bacon and, and the goofy friend. Are and dead. so they don't have this like red flag of like, we should leave. What the hell are we doing here? Mm-hmm. And then they set up later when there is a discovery, why they can't, but we'll get there. the, the sink didn't make sense to me. Yeah. So anyway, so she's like washing herself down with the sink or whatever. And she turns and she thought she saw someone near the shower. Like she saw the shower curtain move. Yeah. So she heads that way and like checking it out, like thinking that like Kevin Bacon's like come to play a joke on her or something or come to, I don't know, cuddle. Um, And she, it's my favorite death in the whole thing. So she turns and oh, she gets yeah. stabbed in the eye with an axe, but, right? But the way... But the way she just takes it. She, she like, turns, she sees the killer. She gives the most pathetic scream. It's literally, ah! She closes her eyes and then she's just, stabbed with an axe in the face. Yeah. It was really great. You're like, you know, if you you had like three seconds that you could have just moved out of the way as opposed to just closing your eyes and taking it like you did with Kevin Bacon. Yeah. Yeah. 
So Steve, this whole time, the camp director, is at a diner. And, oh, I didn't like um, this part. With uh, Sandy. Sandy, <laughs> Sandy is the waitress, this... is thirsty for Steve. Yeah, she's like, you can pay me whatever you want. And he's like, here's a $1.50. No, she says, you can pay me by taking me out to dinner or something like that. Well, what do I owe you? <laughs> Just a night on the town. <laughs> I thought it was no, a little no. bit more explicit. Uh-oh. Well. Uh, Sandy, Sandy like, wanted. like, ha, 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 but how, really, how much do I owe you? She's like, a $1.25. <laughs> Drive careful. I will. Good night. I want to put that creeper stash to use, though. Yeah. So then he's like, "Oh, I better drive back to the camp." Also, why did you leave the camp, kids? And he's literally like, "Well, he he's towing back." We kept calling it a, a jacuzzi. jacuzzi. <laughs> I don't really, I don't remember what he what just has reason. a trailer. I don't, but I don't remember I don't the know reason why, he left. Yeah. Why, why he's like, I got to maybe go get some supplies. But yeah. he's, he's now he's like, all right, now I've got to get back. Yeah, because it's raining and they're probably scared or I don't what? know. <laughs> it's funny. What? These aren't kids. We've got six new counselors up at camp. They are babes in the woods in every sense of the word. So he's driving back and his car gets stalled in the mud. So um, thankfully, a police officer was driving by or maybe he called this guy because they seem to have known each other. It's a small town, but uh, sure. He gives him a ride. He's like, oh, I'll give you a ride back to the camp and we'll deal with your car later when it's not downpouring. So cool. Jeep is no more. So now we flash forward to Jennifer Garner's mom. She is reading... Uh, in the cabin. We, we assumed it was something smutty. Oh, for sure. Oh, but like all of a sudden, I don't remember what ended the strip monopoly, but just like they're like, and we're done. They oh, were yeah, like, yeah, they yeah. were smoking some weed. Oh yeah, having just a when few just beers. when Alice is about to take off her shirt, they were. Oh, the door blows open from the storm. Oh, and they're like, oh, we should call it a night. And like, and, and then and they're all just like, yep, we're done. I was like, so Alice okay. and uh, the guy stay behind. Um, yeah, Alice and the guy stay behind. Bill, but Bill. Oh, Bing Crosby's son. Yeah. But Jennifer Garner's mom is like, I'm going to go read my smutty book. And I was like, yes, girl, I understand. Um, so well, she's reading a book by Candlelight. Bill. And um, she hears, help me. And it like sounds like a little kid, right? So she's like, she looks up. She's like, that was weird. And then she hears it again. So she follows the voice into the rain as one does. And well, of course, it's the killer. I will say, I... We we are not horror movie aficionados, but there's a lot of horror scenes that I watch that I'm like, get out of there. What are you doing? Why are you still in the situation? I will say. If I heard a little kid. That's that's how a killer could get me, mm-hmm. is if I heard someone screaming for help in the woods, I would go out in this storm to try and find out what's going on and how to help them. See, I'd only go and if it was a kid. Adults can suck it. I... <laughs> I will. I it was a very ingenious way to draw someone out, and I really will give major props to the writing on that. Where it's like, I, I think this this was well written from that standpoint of the isolation was great, not being aware of the other murders, and that was a great bait. So, very very good setup there. Yes, and so um she's out by the um, archery shooting range at this point. And um, still hears the voice. And then um, the killer turns on the emergency lights and like blinds her and kind of scares her. And she's like, this isn't funny, guys. And then she dies. But they don't show her death. No, but they they set up for I don't know if it was her introduction. They they had Teddy like shoot an arrow that hits. Oh, the... yeah, yeah, yeah. Like really close to her. It hits the target. Yeah. And and so you have this kind of little like, oh, are, are, are she gonna? And then I, I think it's assumed that she dies by an arrow as well. Yeah. But you know, he had this setup, but they don't really show the payoff. No. And I don't know if they just kind of ran out of budget for some of them because like, I expected every kill was going to be seen and very graphic, and some of them definitely are. And then there's some like I don't think you see Teddy's. No. You just they find him. I don't think you see Bills. You see... We'll get there. Okay. Okay. You see a few, but not all of them. Yeah. And so um, now we go to Alice and Bill, and they're like, oh, we got to find Jennifer Garner's mom, whose name is Brenda, turns oh, out. I like That's Jennifer where they, they say better. that. And they're like, oh, we got to go find Brenda. So they go to her cabin, and because oh, they heard her scream. That's why. Mm. <clears throat> And so they go to her cabin and they find a bloody axe in her bed. And they're like, that's weird. And just put it down and walk <laughs> away. And it's on one hand, it's like, well, you probably didn't want to touch that from a fingerprint standpoint. But two, if someone has a bloody axe in their bed, 
I think I'd stop everything right there. Yeah, I'd be like, we gotta go. The next thing I wrote is, Alice's acting is atrocious. <laughs> Thanks, I wish I had more time to do it. It really is. It's it's rough from the moment you see her. I forget what she did her. specifically in that moment, but I was not pleased. I, I just will never forgive her for her running. She run, She does not run she, like a human she being. She frolics. She frolics. Her arms just kind of flop around, <laughs> and, and she just doesn't look like a human being. And I'm just like, I, I can't. I can't connect with you, girl. You look goofy. So after they find the axe, um, Alice and Bill are like, oh, we got to call for help. And so they break into the camp office, which was locked, and they find a phone to call for help. But of course, the phone lines are cut. Dun, dun, dun. So they're like, okay, we'll take the, the car that we took on the way here. And of course, the car is not working dun, dun, either. Dun. So now we, we focus on Steve. Uh, he's being driven back to the camp by a cop. And <laughs> the cop's like... Oh, there's been a crash. I'm just going to drop you here. <laughs> yeah, like the on the radio, they're like, oh, we got like a 17 car pile up. We need the jaws of life. And he's like, all right, I'm about 15 minutes away. And then he just kind of turns around leisurely. He's like, he's I like, got to let you out here. See you later. It's like, <laughs> you don't want to put the lights and the siren. Maybe forget about dropping them off and go straight to those possibly dead people. Yeah. Oh, so then Steve walks up to the Camp Crystal Lake sign and is blinded by a flashlight and stabbed. Dead. Dead. So now Alice is, go. she's like, I'm going to go to bed because <laughs> we can't do anything. <laughs> so she like falls asleep on the couch and Bill goes to fix the generator because, of course, the power is out. Dun, dun, dun. Power's been cut. Um, so Alex or Alice wakes up screaming Bill. She just did that. She's like sleeping and then she's like, Bill. And then, yeah, oh, I don't we, know why. We, we didn't mention on how Jurassic Park must have ripped off this movie. Oh, yeah, because of the raincoat and the Jeep the, and the rain. There is, yeah, there's a heavy storm. There is Steve walking around in, like, the same yellow raincoat mm-hmm. as Dennis Nedry. He's, like, coming up to a sign, like, blinded. It, it was just like, oh, my God, this is, like, ripped straight from. I'm just expecting acid dinosaur. Dilophosaurus. You're a Dilophosaurus. That's true. So then Alice is like, you know, while Bill is fixing the generator, I'm going to make some powdered coffee. <laughs> powdered coffee. It was like a can and she literally put it directly into yeah. the cups and then she puts just, just one little teaspoon I, and then a teaspoon of sugar and I, then she's boiling water. I'm, I don't know if it's I, dissolvable coffee. Yeah, I've never heard of this magic. It, it, I hope it was dehydrated like coffee. That's the best thing because like everything about it I was like... Did, did, you, you were making this wrong. I don't think you yeah, just seemed gross. Yeah. So Alice decides that she doesn't want to drink the nasty coffee she just made and decides to look for Bill. She finds his poncho and then finds him stabbed with arrows and hung up on the door. Which so we don't see his death. I, w- I want to know how they got him up there personally, but <laughs> So Alice is the last girl. Yeah. But will she survive? We didn't call that one. No. This is this is not who I thought the fi- I was like, <laughs> "Oh, Bill's gonna Bill's gonna be the final boy, and Bill Bill goes out." I'm like, "Oh, Alice is the final girl." Oh. So, um, realizing that people are dying around her now, she um, decides to barricade herself by tying a door with a rope. Yeah. <laughs> And then just grabs random furniture and starts barricading herself. And then she, like, half closes a curtain. But she doesn't bother with the other five windows the, that have curtains. I the, was like, this is the most pathetic effort I've ever seen. Yeah. It, the the whole scene went on too long. And you're like, okay, I get it. She's she's barricaded herself in. And, of cool. course, in this room, there's magically a baseball bat. So she grabs that. And then she grabs a fork from the kitchen, like a, like a long... It looks like a hot dog fork. skewer. Yeah. And then... Um, she's just like waiting in the kitchen, waiting for something to happen. And then Jennifer Garner's mom gets thrown through the window, yeah. um, dead, obviously. And of course, but Alice I, screams. I, I couldn't tell if she was dead. Because oh, because she kind of twitched and moved a little I bit. I was like, oh, are they going to like, if she going to like gasp her air or be like, help me. But no, I think it was just some, some rough acting. Yeah. You try being thrown through a window. <laughs> So then, of course, the Jeep, Steve's Jeep, shows up and Alice thinks it's Steve. But surprise, surprise, it's not. It's the killer. And this is where we get the reveal. So so this is spoilers. If you have not seen Friday the 13th, 1980, <laughs> this this is surprising. If, of course, you're you're like a lot of people. I've actually I had told you this twist before. Yeah, but. I'm glad because while we were watching it, you weren't aware. 
I was very specific in not saying Jason. I was just trying to say the killer and use non-gendered pronouns because I didn't want to give away that the killer is... Mrs. Voorhees. So, how it goes, uh, Mrs. Voorhees is a woman. So, this woman, <laughs> she, she shows up. Well, she could be a man. Um Call so, me so Mrs. This, Voorhees. So this woman shows up and Alice, um, she gives Alice a hug. She's like, it's okay, it's okay. She's like, you know, my son actually went to this camp and he drowned. His name was Jason and he drowned because the cancelers were going to Pound Town. And uh, that's where Mrs. Voorhees goes a little crazy. Like she starts off like hugging her and like, Shh, it's okay. And then she, and she's she, like, yeah, like then Alice she is like, crazy. we gotta get out of here. And she's, then like, she's like, no, no we, don't. we don't. Yeah. Then she goes crazy and she tries to kill Alice. Oh, and then she does this awesome voice. I loved it. She goes, kill her, mommy. Kill her. Kill her, mommy. Kill her. Like, now, like it's supposed to be like Jason's dialogue through her. Uh, this is this is not confirmed, but I am certain that you remember Stuart from Mad TV. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> feel like they Stuart. watched they watched this movie. And that's where he got the voice from, because he's like, kill her, mommy. Gotta kill her. <laughs> oh, yeah, we gotta kill her is what we gotta do. <laughs> it's not what she sounded like. Um, so Alice tries to run away, and Mrs. Voorhees slaps her, like, a <laughs> bunch of times in the face. There's so much slapping it's in a this. a lot of slapping. And so um, she... Alice hits Mrs. Voorhees in the cooch with a gun. Yeah. Because she couldn't get the bullets out in time. Yeah, like the, the actual ammunition is locked and she's like frantically like trying to get this so instead she and just takes the butt of the rifle. That being hit in the groin only works on boys. It does work on girls as well. That's very, yeah. very painful. Stuns Mrs. Voorhees. Sensitive area. So she hits her in the cooch with a gun and runs. Um, Alice hides in the pantry and locks the door. Then, you know, she tries not to breathe and they do a great here's Johnny shot. Yeah. So not Mrs. only are they, they got the axe banging into the door and she peeks through like an all crazed. She does have good crazy eyes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and then Mrs. Voorhees, of course, gets into the pantry and Alice clocks her with a frying pan because I keep my frying pans in the pantry. Yeah. So then she's like, you know. I think I got her. We're good here. Yeah, I'm well, going to go well, you sit see, by the lake. Her, her, Vo- Mrs. Voorhees' head is like bleeding. And Not so immensely, like, though. No, but enough that you think she's down for the count. And of course, we're watching a horror movie. We know she's going to You, gonna, you repeatedly come back. stab them until they don't exist or anymore. Or you tie them up with the rope that you no. tied the door with. Murder. <laughs> so, got to um, murder. So then Alice is like, kill her, mommy. I'm going to go sit by the lake. I'm safe now. Idiot. Of course, Mrs. Well, Voorhees she's like, is fine. Isn't she like playing with a canoe? Yeah, like, she's you're just like, like chilling, sitting doing? there. She's like, hmm, that was a weird day. Everyone I know is dead. This like, person she wouldn't tried be, to murder. Like, I would be in a panic, especially after I think I just killed someone. Like, no. Uh, and so, of course, Mrs. Voorhees goes after her. And Alice runs at her with a machete. I'm so glad that the machete was just chilling by the lake Chekhov's so she could machete. grab it. And she slow-mo chops her head off. Which... So, like, I, all I could think of, like, a katana, right, was, like, built to chop off. Like, it was a expertly designed weapon that, like, with, like, gravity in the right slice, you could take somebody's head off. I don't think a a machete could. I'm not saying it's impossible, but the way it comes One off, queen it's swipe. just like, pop. And, and, her, and it's just slow-mo, and they kind of linger on her decapitated head. Or, like, the decapitated part, and uh, it's a little goofy. Yeah. The slow-mo really hurts all of it, and I feel like it takes away some of the gravitas. But it may have not back in that day. Maybe. I Like I said, I, I hate slow-mo. I think it's rarely used well, and I think in here it just comes off comedic, and especially now, it's hard to take that seriously. I think the idea was make this dramatic moment even more dramatic by slowing it down, and that way you can kind of focus on some of the gore. I, I get the intention. I think it was goofy. Yeah. Um, so then Alice gets in a canoe um, <laughs> on the lake and just sails into the darkness. She's like, well, work's done I'm here. I'm still pretty tired. And I thought that's where they were going to end it. No. Um, but no, they don't. So the next day, um, she's still in a boat, you know, her hands over and the police show up and they're like, ma'am, ma'am, or whatever. They're yelling at her. And she's like, oh, she's kind of like in a weird daze. Like she's very chill. And she's like, oh. The police are here. Like, she doesn't say that, but that's just her facial expression. But then she's pulled into the lake 
by a zombie. Zombie Jason who's zombie kind Jason. of mutated and moldy and yeah. yeah. Pulls her into the lake, but then she wakes up in a hospital screaming. And so that part was a dream, we think. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, they're like, your parents are coming. Everyone's dead. You survived. <laughs> Good job. You get a medal. The end. Question mark? The boy. Is he dead too? So before we get to, you know, our official rating, do you think that was a dream? Or do you think, or do you think like it's supposed to kind of obviously lead into part two where Jason is the killer? I think it was a dream. Oh, see, I, I guess, I guess I see it because, you know, Jason becomes the killer that this, and I, I know, and we'll get into it that why they did that but i guess i personally from a narrative standpoint think it is real so just just my opinion but how many stabs would you give this movie more than mrs Voorhees had to the head um do you want me to go first since you always yell at me and, and yeah say yeah I just you go you? first I, I i'm gonna give it seven okay, I, I was gonna give it a seven as well all right well there we go i think it was inferior to halloween i think halloween was masterful in its cinematography oh yeah halloween's the best i think the acting was far superior in halloween i <laughs> the acting in this was atrocious it was rough. okay actually I, like, I give it a six and a half. Oh, you downgraded it i I, th- I think it's still very strong not being an expert uh, by any means in horror I think this probably did a lot for the genre more than we probably know. Mm -hmm. I think it really upped up some of the idea of gore of, you know, what could be pushed because Halloween was pretty tame from a gore standpoint. Oh yeah, for sure. They don't really show too much. It was more psychological, which I prefer. I'm not a gore fanatic and I don't think this was too gory. I think it was, of its time, and I'm not going to say goofy, but... Uh, I wasn't... It wasn't scary to me at all, and I it wasn't suspenseful to me. There was no point where I was holding my breath. But I liked the ambiance. I liked the storm. I liked the isolated cabin. I thought that was an interesting uh, set piece. I, I liked a lot of it. I think it was realistic, like I said earlier, about putting characters in a situation and having them taken out one by one. I I think there are things, whether we realize it or not, that did kind of bleed into the collective conscious, like Jurassic Park and the, you know, that kind of storm scene. Yeah. Yes, I know it's based on a book. Yes, I, I'm aware of all well, that. I mean, Cabin in the Woods, obviously. I mean, it was based off of, like, all horror movies. Yeah. And it's supposed to be that trope of, well, we go into a cabin and we all die. But I never realized <laughs> just how much... Like, yeah, like how they're literally in this movie, there is that goofy character be like, you can't go up there, it's cursed, or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I, I did really enjoy it. I think there was some definite faults. I think it's inferior to Halloween, but I can understand why this this spawned the franchise that it did. Yeah, I give it a six, actually. You're just going to keep lowering it. I'm going to move <laughs> on before you give it like a five and a half. Jeez. All right, we're going to move on to... Behind the Screens. Ah! So this was released May 9th, 1980. So a couple days before the 13th. As I said, this was after the success of Halloween, which was in 1978. It was also inspired by another movie, Meatballs. What? Uh, That was actually a teen sex comedy that was set in a summer camp. It was released in 1979, directed by... Ivan Reitman starring a young Bill Murray. What? Yeah, I've seen most of it. It's uh, not my favorite, but uh, it was well received for its time. And you would see a lot of marketing that would be like Ivan Reitman, director of Meatballs and Animal House. So uh, it, it was really kind of very key to getting Ghostbusters made. So uh, Meatballs and Halloween were the two inspirations, which is a very interesting dichotomy, but makes sense. Weird. The original screenplay by Victor Miller was titled A Long Night at Camp Blood. You go to Camp Blood, ain't you? And they do, I think Ralph calls it Camp Blood or like some of the town yeah, townies does, call does. it that. <laughs> Producer, director Sean S. Cunningham proposed changing the title to obviously the famous Friday the 13th, mm-hmm. which got to play into, you know, the setting. Oh, and I didn't mention why that date is significant is that's because that's Jason's birthday. 
See, Jason was my son. And today is his birthday. Oh, I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, she says, yeah, today's think... my son's birthday. That's why she goes crazy killing all the camp counselors. Because it's always I... on well, I, I his think, birthday, June 13th. And I think the 1958 killing was July like 3rd or 4th. So that makes sense that she's not like doing an anniversary of his death. It's actually an anniversary of his birthday. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, sorry about that. Miller was unhappy about the filmmaker's decision to make Jason Voorhees the killer in the sequels. Which makes sense, but I'm not really sure how you would continue the franchise with a decapitated killer. Not that it wouldn't be <laughs> impossible, but I, I could understand that, like, what? no, Jason Jason was dead, you know, in the first movie. Whether it was a dream or not, clearly they, they went on to say, you know, he's alive somehow. Makeup designer Tom Savini suggests Jason's appearance at the end. So that that little oh, pop the, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So according to him, quote, the whole reason for the cliffhanger at the end was I had just seen Carrie, lovely sissy Spacek. So we thought we needed a, quote, real arm jumper like that. So I said, let's bring in Jason. So Tom, that wasn't in the script. Tom hmm. Savini suggested, you know, they have this kind of little ending cliffhanger and they just pulled out, let's just have Jason, which then spawned, obviously, mm -hmm. that he would return and that displeased Victor Miller. Welp. Yeah. Sorry. We made your friend. Uh, we. I'm, I'm a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> the movie was filmed at Camp Nobi Bosco in New Jersey. And you see, New like, Jersey. You see the cemetery, like, said New Jersey. Mm. There were, like, some other indicators. So I don't know if Crystal Lake is supposed to be in New Jersey, hmm. but that's where it was filmed. The camp is still in operation and actually has a wall of memorabilia uh, of the original film. Can you imagine going there as a I would, kid? I would be freaking terrified out oh, of my mind. I'd be like, I'm gonna get murdered here. Don't send me to the murder camp. As an adult, I, I'd be like, "Yeah, let's go." <laughs> I, I would, I would totally visit, but yeah, as a as a kid, I don't know if I'd be totally comfortable. Be like, and here's where Kevin Bacon did it and died. I slept. In, I I want to sleep in Kevin Bacon's bunk. Ooh. Composer Henry Manfredini came up with the now classic "Ki Ki Ki." I always know it more as "Ki Ki Ki." I thought it was ch -ch -ch. <laughs> well, however, however you phoneticize it, those are his vocals in the score. And the there was a decision made by him that you would only have music in the movie when the killer was present. I don't know if you noticed that. Oh, I did not. But I was paying attention. It's very clever. And the music like really picks up at the end because obviously, you know, she is very present. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you only hear music pretty much when the killer's present i think the only exceptions are the weird banjo music dun, dun, and dun, then dun, 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 dun. <laughs> at the end there's also kind of a weird song you like that ending song that just doesn't really oh fit. yeah it was like peaceful and like everything's fine you're it, just like what it was a good song but it didn't seem like it matched in in the the context of the film but yeah uh tom savini amazing tom savini was one of the first crew members on board for the film because the producers idolized his special makeup effects in Dawn of the Dead, 1978. Uh -huh. You don't know Tom Savini, but you have been exposed to him because in The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, they bring him up. Ah! Yeah, I thought you'd enjoy that. That's <laughs> the only way you can possibly connect to something is if I bring up Sabrina. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The film takes place on July 4th, 19. 58 so that yeah that that's when the first two murders you occur mean June. no july 4th oh in 1958 oh the first i'm sorry two. i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah 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 and then june 13th is in the the quote present day is what it says um they don't mention a film or a year in the film but historically june 13th was a friday in 19 uh, 1980 hmm. so it actually would make sense that it was the present day would have been 1980 that's cool. Yeah. Now we're going to move on to something I'm really excited about because oh, no. I went down a rabbit hole with this. We're going to move on to the truth. Much as you try to bury it, the truth is out there. Oh, no. So real quick, do you have any idea like what might have inspired or like what might the origin of Friday the 13th might have been? Some crazy person killing peeps. Nope. No, that's not why it's superstitious. I meant like the... Oh, like the, the number. 
the date that oh, yeah no so interesting things about friday the 13th the date it can occur like once to three times in a year so in 2015 there were actually three friday the 13th there was one in february march and november 2022 will only have one which is tomorrow for us oh my god and actually our friends got married on friday the 13th in october of 2017 and my grandmother was born in september 13th which was a friday that's fun yeah okay so before we get into the idea of we're gonna we're gonna talk about two separate things okay the number 13 as unlucky and friday as unlucky okay so 13 was not always an unlucky number in fact there's a lot of traditions where it's a lucky number so in france it was traditionally a lucky number especially prior to world war one it was used as a good luck symbol for postcards and charms in judaism 13 signifies the age at which a boy matures and that's when you have a bar mitzvah or if it's a female a bat mitzvah and then in ancient egypt there were 13 important gods and it was also considered a holy or lucky number as well Hmm. but but sometime it became unlucky so 12 is really considered to be a perfect number, and I don't mean that mathematically. I just mean it's a very whole and a complete number. What? Uh, my mind went to um, three. It's a magic number. No. You know, like School, school of House Rock. Rock. Yeah. yeah. School House Rock, not School of Rock. Yeah. But you have like the 12 Zodiac, 12 months, 12 Olympians, 12 hours, 12 inches. And then to have that 13 is is considered unlucky you kind of it it ruins the completeness of 12 so it's in that way it's sometimes considered just like no oh, you're you're ruining the crowd mm. in tarot 13 in the major arcana is death and uh. if you're familiar with tarot you know that that doesn't necessarily mean if you get the death card that, that you're, you're going dying. to die it or signifies someone you know is dying no it signifies change transformation but obviously there are some that are like, oh, 13, the death. death card. Yeah. The Mayan calendar, it ended on the 13th Bakhtain. And that's where we had the big fear of 2012 as the, the apocalypse. Dying. Yeah. So, you know, all interesting things there. Another origin that a lot of people cite as the reason for, you know, why we, we as a society don't care for 13 is Hammurabi's code. So... It was allegedly, the 13th law was allegedly omitted from a list when it was translated. And everyone's like, why is, you know, this 13th law so, so evil? And really, in, in actuality, the original translator just forgot it. Like, other translations have put it. And he, the laws themselves aren't actually numerically listed. Hmm. So there's not really any significance. It was just kind of a translator error. So that one's pretty debunked. Hmm. Do you know we met in 2013? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> According to folklore, and this is where I think we start to get into, okay, you know, that that might be a, a reason on why we consider 13 unlucky. I, I think this one has something to do with it. According to folklore historian Donald Dosey, the unlucky nature of the number 13 originated with a Norse myth about 12 gods having a dinner party in Valhalla. The Bahala, the trickster god, your favorite Loki. He was not invited, and he arrived as the thirteenth guest and put their daughter under a spell and when she pricked her finger, <laughs> and arranged for horror to shoot Balder with a mistletoe-tipped arrow. Mistletoe, if you're not familiar, uh, is a gross little parasite. I don't know if it's poisonous though. Yeah, why did they say kiss under mistletoe? I'm sure we can get it. Because it's the in. last thing you'll do. Oh my god. So Balder died and the whole earth got dark because of it and pretty much everyone mourned. And so it was a... Except for Loki. It was a bad unlucky day. And so this, from a Norse standpoint, that's why 13 is unlucky. Hmm. And it's quite possible that from Norse mythology, you had that spread to a large portion of Europe. Europe obviously then came over to America and, you know, you kind of had this spread of this idea of 13 being unlucky. That's one possibility. There is also the idea that 13 is often tied to the moon, because usually in a year you'll actually have 13 moons. The moon is usually tied with femininity and the menstrual cycle, 
And so there are some that argue that there was a lunar cult that was repressed that, especially when the solar calendar came out and, quote, triumphed, 13 then be kind of became this unlucky thing. And I want you to kind of keep a pin on that idea of 13 and femininity because it's going to play in later. Women are evil. Well, you're not far off. <laughs> so Friday. Let's talk about Friday. Friday or Frigg's Day, mm -hmm. if you're not familiar with the origin of the name Friday, is named after Frigga or Freya. The Germanic, it's Frigga. In the Norse, it's Freya. So Freya is the goddess of love, fertility, battle, and death. I love her. Friday was considered originally by the Norse as lucky and actually divine. Hmm. And then Friday was in the Christian tradition said to be very unlucky. So you had Friday was the day when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. How could they? The day Cain murdered Abel. Oh. The day the Temple of Solomon was toppled. And also the day Noah's Ark set sail from the Great Flood. So a lot of bad Fridays. How would that be unlucky? What do you mean? Well, it's unlucky for the rest of the world who perish. Yeah, that's God's fault. Well. I got to warn you. You're doomed to stay. <laughs> so the idea of them Friday the 13th is you had this mixing of two very unlucky things. You had Friday, which was unlucky and 13. And so then this mixture seems to be kind of a Victorian invention in 1907, Thomas W. Lawson published his popular novel, Friday the 13th, which was about an unscrupulous broker who took advantage of the superstitions around the world hmm. and deliberately crashed the stock market. That's so fun. that's where we get a little bit more of the modern idea of a Friday the 13th. Can you crash the housing market, please? Thanks. You don't want it to crash. Oh, just kidding. Keep it going. <laughs> so... You then, going on with the Christian tradition, you have the Last Supper of Jesus of Nazareth. So that obviously was on Good Friday. Um, you had 13 individuals who were present. And the kind of like Loki, you have what a lot of people consider the, quote, 13th guest was Judas. Judas, Judas. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> Um, you also have that some claim Friday the 13th came from October 13th, 1307, where King Philip IV of France ordered the arrest of the Knights Templar, and most of the Knights were tortured and murdered. A lot of people are familiar of that origin from the Da Vinci Code. Hmm. So that's where a lot of people will point and say, I already, I already, well, Knights Templar was all questionable, and that's not really the origin. So, so. let's get to the good stuff. Okay. So in the Middle Ages, Christianity started to gain momentum. What I think a lot of people forget is Christianity was not the only religion. Or, or the first. What, no, in the Middle Ages, like I think a lot of people assume like, oh, and just like Christianity dominated. That is when Christianity really started to get popular. But it was really because of what it was doing to other religions. So you had paganism. And yes. this really stood at odds with a patriarchal faith. They, you know, they believed in multiple gods and goddesses. And that's a really big problem with a very different religion that it's like, no, there's only one God. He is male. And if you don't believe in him, you're going to everlasting hell. So you had these pagans that really celebrated Friday and Freya and femininity. And you had 13, which was, you know, very much tied also to that. And a patriarchal religion did not really respond well to this idea of feminine worship. And so pretty much in order to get rid of this belief is they what Christianity would do is they would assimilate certain holidays or certain ideas and then they would reject and repress others. So that's where we get a lot of pagan traditions are in Christmas and Halloween and, and Easter. Easter. All of that was kind of like, well, well, we'll take some of this, but some of it we're going to get rid of. So you had these strong women who are believing they're, they're doing magic on Fridays and praying to this goddess. And Christianity is like, yeah, we're not going to have that. This is all sorcery. No, we shall not suffer a witch to live. Sorceress. And so what they did is pretty much they branded them, those believers, as witches. So... In his book, Extraordinary Origins of Everyday Things, Charles Panati writes, 
quote, when Norse and Germanic tribes converted to Christianity, Freya was banished in shame to the mountaintop and labeled a witch. It was believed that every Friday, the spiteful goddess convened a meeting with 11 other witches, plus the devil, a gathering of 13, and plotted ill turns of fate for the coming week. So, that, I firmly believe, is where Friday the 13th comes from, is... Mm -hmm. Or at least the belief of Friday and 13 being unlucky were both a Christian invention in direct response to that paganism. Then in the Victorian times, those were tied together. Hmm. Now, if you're still doubting me about the Freya and 13 connection and how Christianity might have turned some of that against uh, people, guess what Freya had drawing her chariot? What animal? A cat. A black cat, two black cats. Mm, my babies. And so all of a sudden, black cats got lumped in with, oh, those Being are unlucky. witches. Those are witches creatures. They're familiars. Well, they, are they are unlucky. Yep. They're not unlucky, though. And so Friday, black cats and 13 all got rejected. Mm. And all of a sudden, we are now saying, oh, those are all unlucky things. Mm. But not so much the case. God sent me. Get out of here, man. So the question is, I want to believe. Now I'm a believer. Do you believe it? Do I believe what? Well, I was going with, do you believe that origin, but also do you believe Friday the 13th is unlucky? I totally believe that origin. And no, I don't believe Friday the 13th <laughs> is unlucky. Um, I was going to say, I know a lot of buildings too, like won't have 13th floors because people are superstitious. So they'll just switch from 12 to 14. But if you're on the 14th floor, you're really on the 13th floor. And that is called Truskydecophobia. Oh. The you fear know, of I got to check my building. I don't know if we have a 13th floor. I'm. Oh my a God. I'm of, totally going to check tomorrow. There's a lot of buildings that don't. There are cruise ships that don't. There's a, a lot will avoid that, which to me is insane because it's like, it's not like that. It doesn't exist. You're still on the 13th floor. You're literally floor. on the 13th floor. They're just calling it something different. Yeah. So I I personally have never had a problem with the number 13. I've never found I love it. Friday the 13th to be particularly unlucky. There is very little evidence that, that on those particular days there's any higher rate of accidents or any any sort of misgivings so to me it's this date for whatever reason you know you can kind of pick whatever origin you want but it, it was assigned that this is evil or, or bad luck and, and then therefore and then anybody that you kind of retroactively assume it's kind of like oh bad bad things happen on a full moon or people go crazy I think it's all circumstantial. I think you may notice that it's Full Friday the 13th. Are the best. Are you kidding me? That's never mind. Well, I'm, there are some that believe that like more more people cause accidents on a full moon for whatever reason. Because they're looking at the moon. It's pretty. Well, you, and you also just kind of remember that. But I I thought it was really fascinating. Well, and do you believe? In Friday the 13th? Yes. No, I just said. I, I think oh. it's, it's kind of circumstantial. I... I personally, I think there's probably a lot of factors as everything. I don't think it's as simple as there is only one origin of something. Of course. I, but like I said, I think, I think a you, lot of that plays into it. I, it would make sense, especially mm -hmm. if you think back to how Christianity spread and how it really monopolized things by just kind of saying, yeah, sure. Uh, you want to have this Yule log to celebrate your Yule. That's fine. But we're going to call it Christianity because or Chris, Christmas because it's about the birth of Christ. And mm -hmm. we'll kind of make this compromise. However, you can't be doing this sorcery stuff on Fridays praying to Freya. She is evil. She's a demon. She's a witch. So you, you got to kind of meet us halfway. And they, you know, kind of put some things in this pocket and, and accepted oh, others. Yeah. And it makes sense to me because that's how Christianity just has worked whether people are aware of it or not. And I, I could also see other factors kind of adding to it too. If you're a Christian, leave us your thoughts in the comments. I mean, it's not, their f <laughs> they're, they're not the ones who are <laughs> committing the crusades unless you were. Mm. Mm. So yeah, I thought it was a, it was a really fun movie. I, I really enjoyed yeah, it was, kind of it was finding... fun to watch it with you. I don't think I ever need to watch it again. Oh, I'd, I'd like it was it fine, again. but I wasn't like, Oh my God, this was so good. Yeah. But, 
I I hope you all enjoy a Friday the 13th. If you are especially fearful, then I wish you the best of luck in just trying to get through a rough day. You'll be all right. If you have Triskaidekaphobia, then good luck to you tomorrow. Don't go on the 14th floor because you know where you are. It's really 13. You can't get away. <laughs> Bye.